Hi, hey, hello. Welcome to another edition, episode, whatever, of Trail Society. I'm Corinne Malcolm. I'm Keely Henninger. And I'm Hillary Allen. <laughs> Where is everyone recording from today? Everyone's in a different location than the last time we chatted. Keely, where are you? Oh, I'm at Your work. Location? <laughs> in an undisclosed location. Undisclosed top secret work location. Hilly, where are you? <laughs> I'm in Colorado, but I'm going back to California at the end of this week. Yeah, I'll Weird. see you. I'll see you on Thursday or Friday. Yeah. What are you doing back in California? We're going to Broken Arrow. So I'm racing oh, to have an, another book tour uh, stop. Super excited that the race is actually happening. So oh, yeah. nice. Hillary's not just doing one race at Broken Arrow, though. <laughs> Hillary has signed up for the VK, the I think technically now it's 45K, and I think it's now 23K based on some small course changes. So Hillary's got a lot of racing Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Sunday will be, oof. I mean, Corinne, can you push me up the hill? Like physically speaking, bring a tow rope. <laughs> I'll be Sunday. I'll be in the studio with our good friend at pillars, Dylan Bowman doing live commentary for the, both the VK and the 23, 26 K. Cause it is the North American golden trail series final race. So I think nice. we're competing for spots to go to the finale. So it should be a really competitive field. I'm really excited. Oh, that's awesome. And you're all recovered from your wedding. I am slowly recovering from my wedding. I keep joking. People keep saying, is anything, does it feel different? And I was like, yeah, my left hand is so much heavier. I'm like, it's messing up my running gait. Um, but no, in all seriousness, we made it home safely. Uh, I got to hang out in Bozeman for basically a whole week post wedding as well. So it was just like, it, it was amazing getting to hang out with friends for so long. Oh, and Corinne, she looked so beautiful. It was so great. No, it was. And also basically everyone that I saw at Corinne's wedding is going to be over at Broken Arrow. So it's pretty much the same thing, but now just a race instead of at Ultra Dance Fest. Yeah, it was great. Uh, I iced Steven during our first look. I did a shot ski with my grandmother and my mom did a keg stand. So I, I think I think the Quigley side of the family won won the wedding it was pretty awesome and <laughs> your mom has like the best dance moves also light up shoes like that was corinne was dancing and steven and like light up shoes the whole like bridal and groom party it was amazing yeah so we'll we'll bust them out at some other point i'll i'll take the the light up shoes on a tour tour de force for uh ultra running and and you'll get to check them out at a race down the road keely i promise i will not i will not keep them from you for too long Thank you. I was very concerned. <laughs> one Speaking of, the, of races. Yeah. I was gonna say one of the really cool things is that people have been sending us DMS with race results of ladies slaying it out on the trail. And I'm wondering, um, I put in some race results, um, from the past, the past week. I'm wondering if, if you want me to go through those, if anyone else has any experience with those, those races. No, go through it. Um, so Spartathlon, which I like, remember hearing about like when I first got into ultra before I got into ultra running even, cause I feel like I listened to interviews with, with previous winners on Ian Corliss's, um, podcast. And I got a, an email that said, Hey, I don't know if you saw this, but in the 246 kilometer, that's 152 mile road race. Um, the top three women were seventh, ninth and 10th overall led by, uh, Diana Zatvia of Latvia in seventh overall, the first place woman followed by Susanna Mraz of Hungary, I believe in ninth overall. And then, um, Nora Hankla of Finland was 10th overall. So like really, really cool. Like <laughs> women go the distance. Um, and like they ran that far in like 25 hours. It's a really long ways to run. Oh. Um, really, really cool too. Um, the, the winner of damn Yeti hundred mile overall, like the outright winner of the race. Uh, I think she won by like 15 ish minutes, maybe 20 minutes overall. Um, Amy Hamilton won the race in 15, 23, once again, smoking fast hundred mile race. Um, and then my favorite story, I think of the past two weeks was fan favorite, uh, Canadian human rights lawyer, Stephanie case. Um, if anyone, if you've gotten to meet her, she is phenomenal. The work she does is, I mean, a blessing to all of us. Um, she was third overall in the 450 kilometer 
Tortoise Glaciers in Italy. It's the like the big, big long event um, that accompanies Tour de Jean, which is another big Italian race, super long as well. But third overall, it was like, I mean, I think she slept like, I think accumulatively like six hours or something over like a hundred and some hours of racing. It was, and it's not marked, like it's not marked. They have glacier travel. It's insane. So once again, women throwing down, um, Keely, did you put this last point in there? Yeah. Yeah. I have a cool stat from ultra trail Australia. They posted on their Instagram this past week that they now have more female runners than male runners for the first time ever in their race series. And 44% of those runners are new to ultra trail Australia. So they were kind of excited that the sport is growing and that they're getting more females, which is sweet. That's awesome. That's so, so very cool. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Another thing on social media this week that I was really like looking into was some of your tweets, Corinne, um, about the quartz program. Um, what you had tweeted six days ago is that the quartz program is practicing medical discrimination for athletes with chronic medical conditions to make a point about purity in the sport. More so, they are banning the use of any substance that would require a TUE within seven days of competition. So what are the asthmatics and those with autoimmune conditions to do? I imagine the idea is that you are supposed to be healthy to compete, but legally the world, the wording is sus. This is regarding um, UTMB's most recent press release banning NSAIDs. Um, do you want to go a little bit more in details for us around those tweets? Those were pretty well-written tweets and I got down a rabbit hole reading them. <laughs> yeah, I am. I was pretty, pretty aggressive. And then uh, Jason Coop also put out like a 35 tweet thread um, on the same topic, which is great. Cause that's a lot of time to put that all together. Um, but essentially this got a lot of like clickbaity action right after the announcement from UTMB. Cause like oh, NSAIDs, what's happening with NSAIDs? Who's banning NSAIDs? And that got me down the rabbit hole of the courts program, because many of us who race on the ultra trail world tour, because we like, we've, we've been in contact with these, with these, uh, these individuals, um, the courts program has been around for a long time. And they've been a they've been a part of our sport. Um, I got introduced to them via Solomon back in the day, and they've always been focused. I think we you know just taking a step back here. They've like who are they? They've always been focused on like oh like we're we're about the health of the athlete. We're doing health monitoring of the athlete. We're doing research. We're doing health research in this space. Like we're doing this important thing. I've actually spoken at a conference sponsored by Ultra Sports Science Foundation before, um, which I think is, you know, like it's, it's, they, they have this, like, it seems like a good mission, but what they have started to implement with races that partner with them. Cause once again, these are not, they're not a governing body. They're not a governing agency. They are, they are a French agency. That's kind of totally on their own. Um, the races they partner with though, they are starting to implement more than a health screening. They are starting to do post-race and pre-race drug testing, looking for specific things, um, which goes beyond kind of typical drug testing. I'm wondering, we've, we've all, all three of us have taken part in ultra trail world tour races. Has anyone, um, inter like have either of you interacted with courts, either pre-race or post-race or at, at, at a race location? Uh, yeah, I have. Um, and it was basically just, again, this is in partnership with uh, a UTMB race, so TDS, when I was asked to give a blood sample in the week or two, I, I think it was uh, maybe two weeks before um, uh, before competing. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was just basically a, just a basic blood test, like a base, basic screening. So um, for, in my experience, it, it's generally just like, you know, any kind of outlandish outliers, right. That you could pick up at this basic, this basic blood test, but, um, you know, nothing really, um, nothing really out of the ordinary. Right. I mean, it was just basically tech checking my health. Um, and then afterwards I was asked to give a blood sample the day before the race of TDS. And then, um, that was it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. And what I think is funny, what I think is funny about these though, is that at least in my experience, they give you about a 72 hour or more window to get tested. So you get this very, very, very sketchy email. Um, and then you have to take said sketchy email to uh, a blood testing like unit or like 
spot that will actually test your blood and, and fax it or email the results without any sort of like US doctor. And so for me, it was really, really hard to find a place that would actually do it. Um, and I actually went to a place that they didn't even card me. I ended up just asking them to card me afterwards. Cause I was like, what is going on? And, and they, they sent the results on over. Um, and yeah, to Hillary's point, like it was just a CBC, um, and you get your own results. And I mean, mine showed pretty high hematocrit cause I was like just back from altitude and super dehydrated, but like, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to track blood results, um, for doping or anything like that through a plain old CBC. And then yeah, to Hillary's point, they also test you pretty close to the race, um, mm -hmm. which is, which is also pretty interesting, but yeah, always framing it around health. And I think a lot of their presentations are also very, very geared towards reminding us that they are with our health in mind. Yeah. It's with your health in mind. It's a health focused thing. And I think that I think some of their initial ideas, obviously I haven't talked to anyone from their organization recently. Um, was the UCI, the International Cycling Union, um, does what's called a biological passport where they, so basically they're submitting a CBC, um, maybe an iron panel as well. So you get, you get ferritin in that mix um, to the UCI to track over time through the kind of their anti-doping agency. And the idea there too, is if you were doing blood doping, right? If you were either infusing your own blood or using EPO, maybe you would be able to see something in your CBC, they look for outliers that way. And so maybe that was their, okay, this is a little bit anti-doping, but, but it's about the athlete's health to start with. And then the other thing really interesting about courts and not only do races partnership with them, but they, they're trying to like partner athletes specifically with them, which feels a lot like pay to play. And I think you've both read more kind of on this specific aspect of it. I'm wondering if we can just describe that. Cause this is very different than USADA or WADA or a normal anti-doping agency. What, like, what does it mean to partner in quotes here? I'm going to use air quotes, partner with the quartz program. So, and I can hop in here too, because I was, and it's exactly that from, from what I'm reading, it is a pay to play because Corinne will let you kind of get into this a little bit diff, different. What is the governing body of WADA and USADA? Um, but courts is quite different than that. Um, how I'm reading it is there's a level one and a level two. And so you can actually pay. Um, again, I think they're advertising it as more of, if you want to monitor your health, I know some of my, some of my athletes that I coach or different people, you know, they have maybe a, a doctor that they can get regular blood testing, right? So that's a way to monitor your health. So Quartz is offering this program for anyone, uh, any runner kind of at level one. Um, but then where it gets a little bit different is at this level two, where it's just for elites. And this is maybe where there's kind of a higher level of testing, but this is, I think, where there's this fuzzy line, which I don't quite understand, but it's definitely partnered with certain races that are partnered with Quartz. And they're, you know, basically testing athletes who are requiring blood samples. Um, and these elite athletes aren't paying into this program, but they're requiring blood samples for athletes of a certain ITRA score. So right higher, a certain number threshold higher and above. Um, and so, you know, you can opt into this program, like at a level one, and you can pay to use this service. Um, or, you know, there's other race organizations that are just requiring it for elite level entry and then, you know, trying to go about more of this clean sport, um, angle. Yeah. And then kind of just to add to that, there's also a new, like a little buzzword on their site called a courts elite. That, um, is something that elite athletes can do on their own. Um, and they talk about this as a way for you to become like part of this elite program is by donating 2000 euros to the ultra sports science foundation Casual. to fund Casual. this elite program, um, saying that you or your sponsors can fund this. And, you know, 60 to hundred percent of this could be tax exempt depending on the country. Um, and then option two would be to wait for them to find funding for you, but they caution you that this solution is more random and much less fast. So I don't know if I will recommend that solution. Um, and then once you do all of this, you know, fundraising and pay this 2000 euros, um, basically then they'll be, you'll be sending them some medical monitoring or previous results. This part is very vague. And then the experts, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> experts. <laughs> uh-huh. Continue Keely. You've got the sound of that. <laughs> the experts. 
<laughs> I'll, I'll cut a little bit of the laugh out, but we'll keep some of it. Um, the experts from the courts commission will then be studying your profile. And then if your results are normal from these previous blood tests, um, you will be integrated into this lovely courts elite program. And then they, they sign off with a nice, now it's your turn to play. So uh, what do we think about that? See, I think this whole thing is a little bit screwy. Is it um, sketchy? Yeah, does, this, so- does it sound sketchy to you at home? Because it sounds sketchy to us. This does not, if you, even if you know nothing about anti-doping, there should be many red flags here. Like what is going on? This is the first thing that people teach you um, to check the credibility of the sources. If, you know, the, the, per- I, I was reading this like study in graduate school. If, you know, like there's this reach research on aspartame for, you know, diet Coke and there, te- there, there's this research paper that says the conclusion in the abstract say that aspartame isn't bad for you. It's not a carcinogen. It's, it's totally fine. And you look at who funded the research and it's Coca-Cola. So this kind of seems like, this is happening potentially. Yeah, and so I was gonna say this has ties back to sports organizations. I think Solomon was a, a very early initial funder of courts. I think they still are a funder of courts. That's why they've partnered with the golden trail series. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of commonalities here, French company, French, French program, French, French testing. Um, Bad translations with the experts. Oh man. It's just, it's really hard. And I think initially when this came out, I don't know if they had to do away with this for legality purposes, but I'm pretty sure when they were encouraging us to sign up for this, like a couple of years back, they also wanted, they were trying to promote transparency and they wanted to basically have all this information public. So you could go in and search and be like, Ooh, what's Killian Journey's CBC look like. And that seems like a huge HIPAA violation with your medical information just publicly available and people are like, Oh, well, what, what do you have to hide? Right. It's just the CBC. And it's like, sure, sure, sure. It's just a CBC, but it's like, that doesn't seem like a system, even with normal drug testing, which we'll talk about in a little bit, even with normal drug testing, stuff is not made public unless you test positive for something. Right. Like, this like this idea of like transparency and holding each other account- accountable by like forcing you to buy into a program and then publicly have your medical information displayed seems like a huge overreach. And this this organization seems to continually overreach existing medical institutes, existing anti-doping agencies. Like it's a little bit insane. And maybe that's a good spot to talk about what what are they trying to implement now beyond health into anti-doping? Does that does that sound good? Yeah, well, Corinne, I think there's just maybe one thing we want to touch on before that would be like, why is there concern around courts? Like, why wouldn't we be super stoked on them, um, like implementing these procedures in our races and trying to have like, uh, you know, a, a regulatory body around drug testing? So I think a regulatory body is really important. And I think this is a conversation that ultra running needs to be having. Um, but I think that the courts program, it's it's not a WADA certified testing protocol. Like it doesn't, once again, it's going beyond its own thing. So it doesn't have the security measures put in place that WADA and USADA, our US anti-doping agency utilize where they're collecting multiple samples, they're preserved, there's a chain of custody, you know, you've got it, they're sealed, they're sealed by the athlete. You know, it takes out all this like nonsense of like what is happening with your sample (laughs) after the fact. There's security for the sport and for the sport community to trust the samples. And then there's security for the athlete to know that someone's not messing with their samples. Someone's not saying, oh, let's just put a little testosterone into so-and-so's blood sample and see what happens. Like courts doesn't have that established. They're kind of like the wild west of quote unquote drug testing. And I think that that should be a major red flag for anyone in the mountain trail ultra community when it comes to like, oh, should we sign on with this or not? And something to add on to that, which I think is important because this, uh, this idea of trust, right. And I think where I've had a little bit of mistrust in courts is because they're not even honest with what they're, what they're testing for. And, you know, basically you, you find out when you're being tested, like they're drawing your blood, um, what they're actually looking this for. This happened at UTMB this exactly. year. Exactly. We were told by an athlete from UT at UTMB this year that they were, they were told that, oh, and by the way, we're looking for NSAIDs, which we're going to talk a lot about in a little bit, but like 
what do you mean you're testing for this substance, like this thing that you didn't tell us you're testing for mm -hmm. that in any other realm is not an illegal or banned performance enhancing sub like substance to be ingesting. So that's a, that's a major, a major issue. Yeah, yeah, totally. So going back to like your initial tweet call Corinne, like what, what did they implement this year? Like what, why is this NSAID thing a big deal? Why did it get so much press? What the heck are NSAIDs? Yeah. So I mean, we'll, I can, well, we'll let, we'll let, we'll let Hillary do her NSAIDs chemistry rant in a second. Yeah. We're going to talk through <laughs> the overarching, like what Quartz is trying to do first, because I think that's important. And I think it goes, I think the things that are sketchier than the NSAIDs are the other things they're trying to implement. And those are the things that you should be concerned about. And that's what my, that's what my Twitter ranting has been about. So to fill you all in, um, this actually, I think probably was supposed to go into place, go into effect in 2020 in any ultra trail, any ultra trail world tour races, which is UTMB. UTMB is, is that organization. They are the crown event of that. And they will be the crown event of the UTMB world series moving forward. So any race affiliated with them to qualify for UTMB in future iterations is going to fall under this as well. So if you want to race in those races, this is, this is what's going to like, this is affecting you. So, um, they're banning things in three categories. They're going to start with things that are banned within 60 days before the start of competition. And they only have one thing listed there and it's specifically IV iron infusions. Um, what, you know, like if you're saying, oh, from the health side, yeah, if an athlete's so anemic that they need an iron infusion, maybe they shouldn't be running and racing. That being said, there are a number of medical conditions that might cause you to have clinically low or dangerously low iron that doesn't prevent you from, from racing, from running, from, from training. I personally have been in this boat. Um, I've needed two iron infusions in the last, I guess, two and a half years due to clinically low iron. I don't absorb it. I have like a, a auto an, I've got an autoimmune condition essentially from, a, uh, from overtraining almost a decade ago, um, in which that I, I cannot absorb iron from my diet, from supplements, from the food that I eat. And so the way we get around that so that I have, so that I can build red blood cells and have any iron is periodically we keep, we monitor my blood every three months. And when I get clinically low, all of a sudden that that's when an I like an IV iron infusion would come in. Um, the concern there from people like, um, which I get a TUE for, which we'll talk more about TUEs in a second too. Um, like it's approved. If I was to be tested by water or USADA, I am okay. But under quartz, I wouldn't be able to race for 60 days after this. Um, which is, I don't know, it's frustrating. They, they don't want people to artificially, artificially increase their, um, oxygen carrying capacity. And there is a risk, right there. There's an allergic reaction risk for IV iron infusions. There's also a risk that you could have too much iron in your body, which then, um, is dangerous because it can, um, end up in your organs. So we don't want people just, you know, pumping iron into their veins unless it's absolutely necessary. So there's totally. a health component. And, there and I mean, I'm just going to interject quick. And I, I think they also have a little bit of a doping um, like lens on this thought too, is that, you know, if you are just like slightly overtrained all the time and you're just like really towing that line and you're just getting iron infusions to like keep yourself high because you're actually just training so hard that you're keeping it kind of low and you just want to keep it high. Like to me, that feels unnecessary. That can be sketch, well, right? right? That could That's be sketch too. So there's parts of this that I understand, but there's also completely parts that I, I don't understand. But it's very yeah, completely, yeah. It's very possible though. So when I know when I get IV iron infusions, it bumps my ferritin so high that it would be dangerous if I didn't start with a super, super, super low ferritin value. And so, and if when you have a high iron, you also so people sometimes will supplement with iron without getting their blood tested because they think they're anemic. And it turns out they actually have high iron. So having high iron where you literally need to have your blood drawn to reduce your iron levels. Um, it's called hemochromatosis, I think someone correct me, um, slide into my DMS, correct me, but essentially like you also feel anemic in that sense. So they're, they're like the amount that's being infused is generally like the clinical amount would be too high for people who aren't truly anemic. Um, totally. so something to keep in mind there, but when we move forward from that, um, there are, there is a subset of things that are banned 
within seven days of competition. And this to me is the part that gets really, really messed up. That includes once again, IV infusions. They, they're very vague in this. The, gen, the idea here is that they're probably trying to ban um, rehydration, like saline um, solutions. So if you're in a stage race, right? Like it makes sense that getting, getting a bag, getting an IV at the end of the race might be a really good thing um, for recovery, but banned. And that's actually banned in, um, in by WADA and USADA as Before well. Or after Corinne? It generally, I mean, it's not, I mean, gen, in general, IV, IV infusions mm. are, <laughs> can only be delivered in a certain dose over a certain number of hours. Um, to, to eliminate the benefit from getting it. But so I, I've known cyclists who have ended up in the ER cause they've had a really bad crash and they refuse the IV, the, like the IV fluid because they don't want to get in trouble, which is like, you can't test for it. Right. Like the only reason you get in trouble is because someone sees you, sees you do it. So that's why we always chuckle when you're at like a start of an Ironman or an Ironman expo. And there's like IV, like B12 and weird and weird shit like that. That's, you're not supposed to do that. Okay. So <laughs> more than likely they're talking about IV liquids for rehydration here. That to me, pretty reasonable, but that once again, that's not an overreach from normal USADA or WADA stuff. It's just very vague in how they describe it. They also then list gas inhalation. Once again, gas inhalation. What are you, what are you inhaling? Um, I think that this is probably a, um, a reference to things like the gray zone of doping. Um, the Russians in 2014 were busted for huffing xenon gas out of inhalers um, around the Sochi Olympics. No, maybe that was even before that. This might've happened at the Vancouver Olympics, um, which would have been 2010. Um, but essentially huffing xenon gas, um, it competes for oxygen binding to your hemoglobin, which allows you to train in a, in a hypoxic state. So they are getting, it's like, a, it's, it's really, it's not a great idea. So just don't huff no. lean on gas. Um, this might be a reference to inhalers, but that'll be, that's also covered by TUEs. So I'm not sure exactly if they're referencing inhalers here. It could also be that technically oxygen, which we all breathe normally is considered an ergogenic aid. And in certain sports, they have tried to use, um, supplemental oxygen on the sidelines mm -hmm. in like football and soccer matches as a way to like boost recovery so that, that you can put a player back in, on the field. Um, it's really short lasting. It's not a very practical ergogenic aid and definitely is not a practical ergogenic aid for our sport. So I'm assuming that is what they're referring to under gas inhalation. The big one, the biggest, I think the biggest issue are the next couple. Um, and that is they are banning the use of anything requiring a TUE or a therapeutic use exemption. This is, these are things that normal anti-doping allows you to do because you have a medical condition that necessitates a certain type of treatment. And so they've banned this huge list of things that fall under urgent or fall under TUEs. And I'm wondering if, if you guys want to add in experiences with TUEs here, you want me to list like what are typical things that require TUEs to help, like help the audience understand exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, I think, go ahead. No, I think it would just be helpful to, to, to know a few things like where, so this is, this is something where you can have an exemption for like current set an, an existing medical condition. So I think common in the world of ultra running, maybe people have heard of something, like a thyroid condition. Um, you know, you can like, yeah, so thyroid, thyroid, thyroid conditions have their own section here. They, they're right. okay with thyroid conditions, but they're not okay with ADHD or adrenal insufficiency or anaphylaxis. Hey, you get stung by a bee sting, you get stung by a bee and, or you eat a peanut race week. You better not use that EpiPen because that is a med medication for anaphylaxis. So it's like, that's weird. Um, asthma. I know so many athletes with either asthma like gen generic clinical asthma or, um, actually has induced, uh, bronchoconstriction style asthma, which, you know, oftentimes they get from their sport over time, mm -hmm. but you're saying that an athlete can't use their inhaler. Like Ma Maggie Guterell tweeted me back and she said, are you me like, do you say that the medically prescribed inhaler that I use from my doctor, if I wanted to raise UTMB, I couldn't use it if I needed it. Like that's dangerous. Like mm -hmm. that is, that is insane to me. So there's a bunch of things that go under there too. Um, people with infertility or polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's actually, um, a famous athlete on the golden trail series who, 
um, had served a very minor suspension um, back in the day from not having a TUE for an infertility medication that she was on at the time while trying to conceive. So there are things where it's like, yes, you need a TUE. You're allowed to compete in most every other sport while using these things as long as you have a TUE. So just kind of, to me, it's, it's crazy that this is a conversation that we're having. Like you have to do work to get a TUE. Do I like, do either one of you like have experience with the TUE system or, or friends who have had to get TUEs for things? Just for the asthma, things like this. But I also think the one thing, the one thing that I see from a chemical perspective that's in common with all of these TUEs that have banned is that they're steroids. And I know that steroids get like a really bad reputation for, um, you know, for doping. And like, you know, you do you think of steroids, you think of testosterone immediately, at least I do. But I don't think that this is this is helpful in this way, especially like you said, you have to go through work to get these. They're pre-existing medical conditions. So, but I personally don't have any um, experience with the TUE or needing one. Um, and asthma is the most common one that I've, that I've uh, experienced. Um, but yeah, we're getting into the danger zone here. When we're talking about, you can't use these if you want to participate in a race and it's this all kind of ultra clean. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah. it's a pure, it's a purity thing. Yeah. I'm going to use that in quotes there. Cause I think it's, I think it's bullshit. There, mm-hmm. I said totally. Oh. And, and I mean, let's just remind everyone that a therapeutic use exemption was created so that athletes could use said therapeutic in a race and they were getting an exception by their doctor. So like this TUE was created so that they could be used during sport. And then we're just going out and saying, never mind, you cannot use them. And what's super ironic about this is that on the Sports Science Foundation, which is what is founded by courts or what founds courts, is that they say that they are they are doing their best to support sport and chronic diseases because they feel that athletes with a chronic disease, something like diabetes, which would be something you cannot use the TUE, like your TUE would be used, would be banned for high blood pressure, asthma. They must be supported even more than others. To date, we do not know precisely how many athletes are practicing with chronic medical problems. Investigations are necessary, but this is a This is a field they've called out as people they want to support. And yet they are now going into this protocol saying that within seven days before competition, actually all of these people that we actually wanted to support before, just kidding, all of your TUEs that are something that's allowing you to participate in this sport that you would otherwise not be able to are no longer allowed. And that to me is just the biggest juxtaposition out there. That's insane. They refer to it as legal doping in many, in many tweets, they refer to any, to using any of these substances as, as legal doping. And they hope that the the actual clean athletes will get to shine through. Like it's, it's insane. They, they put out a report post Tokyo Olympics or a tweet post Tokyo Olympics saying that, you know, how many positives were there for like actual banned substances. And then what percent of the population at those Olympics were using in their quotes, legal doping. And it was like 20% or something, probably largely inhalers, honestly. Um, Do you think of how many swimmers are there? Like swimmers, so after Nordic skiers, swimmers are the next most common subgroup of athletes to get exercise induced bronchoconstriction because you're ventilating super high with an irritant that you're inhaling constantly. And so it's like, to me, it's insane that they started out with the stance of health of... um, of supporting these athletes. And now instead they're vilifying these athletes. And I think there's this standpoint where it's like, okay, well, it's an advantage. Like if we're saying, oh, all athletes are competing naturally in their most natural self, their purest self, like it's just a natural advantage that I don't have a chronic medical condition. Like to me, that's what that says. And it's like, that seems, I think we should celebrate athletes who can compete despite medical conditions, despite the hand they've been dealt. Like is it fair that someone's got a naturally high VO2 max versus someone else? Like, where do you draw the line? Right. Like, like, are we going to go to genetics? Oh, you have a better, like you genetically are more predisposed to metabolize B12 better. Like, should you be banned? Is that an unfair natural advantage? Like, it's just, to me, it's like, where do you draw the line? And they've chosen to draw the line, I think on the wrong side here. Totally. I just think that though, there is one, There is one merit to this, and that would be, I think, promoting those who maybe are overtraining right now from perhaps not doing that. Because in my experience as a coach and as an athlete, I've seen a lot of people who have almost like given themselves low levels of certain hormones or certain things that, you know, 
they normally wouldn't be that low, but they're just training in an improper way that they've gotten them that low. And, and you can go to a physician who is like going to prescribe you a thyroid hormone because you have, you know, maybe sort of low thyroid hormone. And, and I think that's where maybe some of these people are trying to stop that kind of trend where like, you're right on that borderline, but you're really only there because you're training incorrectly and you're just getting that extra boost to bring you back up. And like, I think once again, that's where maybe they this allow, is starting, but they allow synthetic hormone use, their thyroid use. Like they, they're yeah, banning that's... testosterone, they're banning, they're banning adrenal, like so cortisol style stuff. They're banning, um, they like hypo, like hy- hypogonadism is part of that. So that'd be like, art, like mm-hmm. using synthetic t- testosterone to treat that. Um, totally. So they're, yeah, ban- that's they're a good not point. banning the one thing they're not banning is synthetic thyroid medication. Right. Which, which is, is probably is, the most sketchy one, right? One which of the more I think a lot of people TV. get. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I had a doctor recommend it to me and I had, I literally had to be like, I don't feel like this is correct. I think I am just severely overtrained. I need to work to get my period back. I shouldn't just be given thyroid hormone. Like, do you know what I do? Yeah. And, but a lot of doctors don't take the time to understand. They're used to a, a, a me, like a, a world now where they have medicines that fix everything. And so their first thought is like, let's give a medicine. And that's a, and, that's and a rabbit hole. But with like, with, with like, for example, you know, obviously Alberto Salazar being banned in part because he was was acquiring prescriptions for athletes who did not have clinical conditions, including synthetic thyroid medications, synthetic testosterone, either in creams or oral, oral ingestation. So it's like those things, like they've done research on, I think inhalers are probably the biggest group that you're going to see people need TUEs for in our sport, um, outside of autoimmune conditions. And they've done research with, with inhalers, with bronchodilators, in populations who do not require bronchodilators and it doesn't do anything. It makes, if anything, it makes you shaky, like great. Okay. Now you're just going to feel jittery, you know, on the start line. It's not good. It's not going to, it does not do anything for people who do not need it. And in order to get a TUE for a bronchodilator, for an inhaler, you have to go through a t- they, they, they have to go induce an asthma attack in the lab. Like, it's not like I can go just get an inhaler because I've got a cough and then apply for a TUE with that. So it's like, I think the idea of a TUE is that it should eliminate some of the like, quote unquote, gray zone doping stuff. But I think that that's probably their angle. Like you said, like people getting, getting medications that they don't actually need, or they don't truly need. Um, but a lot of these things you wouldn't take unless you actually needed to like, totally. Right. I feel like someone just read, you know, the win it all cost book by Matt Hart and was like, all right, now let's make this list. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting because then really the only now real TUE that we have on this list are the thyroid medications. Yeah. They've also and, banned one other thing they've banned right. that's important to add is glu- glucocorticoids. Mm-hmm. Um, once again, we talk about steroid use, um, oftentimes used to treat autoimmune diseases, allergies, asthmas. Um, they're going to help with inflammation, um, in those, in those populations, generally speaking. Um, but yeah, like that stays in your system for a long time. Also, if, if it's mm-hmm. something that you medically need, like is skipping it for seven days, a great, I- a great idea. Like, I don't know. So maybe it's partially for health, but it seems like they're really attacking people with chronic medical conditions here. And I don't know that that's the best thing for our sport with thyroid medication being the only thing that here that's acceptable here. So if you've got, but they do say, yeah, partial here's the, here's the catch, I guess they say thyroid, since thyroid, um, synthesis hormones, um, are banned except in the case of partial or total removal of the thyroid. So if you had thyroid cancer, um, which we know, we know several people, I think, um, who are, who are, uh, in our sport to some degree, um, who have had that done. I've got an athlete who had to have that done. Um, or hypothyroidism of medical origin. So in theory, that should eliminate, oh, you're a little overtrained. Here's some thyroid medication. Um, as opposed to you can get hypothyroidism from other, it's, yeah. I think it's called <clears throat> primary. There's, there's a primary hypothyroidism and a secondary, and I should remember this and I don't, um, True. but one's going to be caused by another medical condition, like generally speaking. And so that like, that then eliminates that that, oh, you're on the fence. Here's some thyroid medication. Yeah. But then we're just talking back to square one that you have a TUE for the thyroid medication. So this whole little extra bullet makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. It's, it's a little (laughs) bit, it's a little bit crazy. 
unless, yeah. unless you've had thyroid cancer, in which case then you're yes. fine. Um, and <laughs> then the one that's gotten a lot of attention, um, via the UTMB press, br- press briefing is things that are banned within 24 hours of competition. And they are one, all beta two agonists, regardless of mode of administration, bronchodilators, like talk about, I'm not going to say the word I wrote in the document, talk about really dangerous. Okay. (laughs) And then two, all painkillers, including tramadol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, i.e. NSAIDs, regardless of the mode of administration. And like, it's like, okay, what, what are, is it a dosage that they're testing for? You know, there are things generally there's a threshold level drug, right? Like, is it a small amount in your system is a large amount in your system. Um, and there's a lot of issues here, I think from a biochemical side, um, as far as, um, how long it's in your system, that's up for debate. It seems like the likelihood that is that acetaminophen is in your system for potentially a lot longer than 24 hours. And so then you'd be unfairly they can't, they can't differentiate if you took it 20, 48 hours ago or 24 hours ago. Um, but that's going to kind of, we, I think we should touch on this a little bit now, Hilly, about how NSAIDs work. And then we will talk about it again um, in just a little bit when we, when we talk about any potential medical health stuff that we've learned about more recently in the ultra running space. So Hilly, what do you got? Yeah. So, I mean, just a little bit, I don't want to go too much into the chemistry or anything like this, but so NSAIDs, I mean, like, like Corinne mentioned, they're basically they're they're trying to inhibit inflammation. And one of the ways that NSAIDs go about this, so it's a non-steroid, right? So we talked about steroids before. This is a non-steroidal inflammation, like in, in inhibiting inflammation in a different way. And what they do is they block prostaglandins. And so when we're talking about name brands, we're talking about Aleve, we're talking about ibuprofen, and we're talking about aspirin. Um, and so Tylenol is kind of a different has a different chemical. Um, and so we, they haven't included that in this, um, but that also has, you know, different health implications. I think, um, you know, Tylenol overdoses, you can, it impacts more the liver, um, but, but it yeah, is a so, painkiller. And so yes. should it be listed here or not is a question. It's yeah. not an anti-inflammatory, but it is, it is an anti-anagesilac. Wow. That's not a word I can pronounce, um, which is, which is a pain reliever. Essentially. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, so it's just a different mechanism. So they're definitely going after the, like the inflammation path ways. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, there's different mechanisms of actions, but I think the, really the, the, the important part here is to note that everyone's metabolism is different. So for instance, you know, me as a redhead going into receiving any sort of surgery or anything, I, you know, I metabolize drugs differently. I metabolize, you know, um, anesthesia differently than other people. So I would probably metabolize NSAIDs differently than other people. And, you know, when you read the, the dosage, right? There's, again, this kind of goes into the fault of uh, physiology studies is that most of these studies are done on, you know, men, um, white men between the ages of 20 and, you know, 40, right? Um, And so these dosages are actually, they're not really representative of the the whole population um, and women. And so I I would say that there's like a certain 24-hour period, which you can't exceed a number of milligrams, um, depending on the dosage of, you know, ibuprofen. So uh, these NSAIDs, um, which to me indicates that there's actually a longer half-life than 24 hours. So that this is this, you know, banned substance. Um, Wait, so Hilly does WADA test for NSAIDs? Yeah. And this is an important distinction. Uh, no, WADA does not test for NSAIDs. Why is this Corinne? They've been deemed, they've been deemed to not be an issue. So briefly, right. Like we've talked a lot about this new implementation of this new quote unquote anti-doping system. Um, but it's insane in part because drug testing already exists, right? It's utilized in other sports. It's utilized at the Olympic level, the national level, the international level. And so they, there's a rationale as to why certain things are banned within the ant, in, in, within an anti-doping system. And so what WADA has done, and once again, WADA is the world anti-doping agency. Okay. Big agency oversees everything. Um, so WADA said, Hey, there's, there's three criteria and a, and a substance or a supplement or a strategy, i.e., you know, like infusing yourself with your own blood. Um, it needs to fall. It needs to meet or satisfy two of three criteria to be considered banned. And their criteria criteria for that are one, it has to, it has to have the potential to enhance, um, 
sports performance. Two, it represents an actual or potential health risk to the athlete. And three, it violates the spirit of the sport. Okay. So it needs to meet two of those three things. So they do take into account athletes health. Okay. And does it, does it, you know, either then is it performance enhancing or is it a violation of the spirit of the sport? Okay. So they, they already look at substances through that lens. Additionally, substances or methods which mask the effect or detection of a prohibited substance are also prohibited. IE that's why a lot of things that, um, were like diuretics that would cause you to shed a lot of water, um, or, or flush things out of your system are also going to be, are on the band list, although they're not performance enhancing outside of that context. So there's a method to the madness of the drug testing that already exists. We're not reinventing the wheel with quartz. We're not making it better. And so to me, that is so insane that a, that race organizations while partnering through this entity now get to make up their own rules. Okay. And I think, I think personally that's dangerous and confusing, right? Because there is no, and part of that is because ultra running and trail running has no international governing body and has no national governing bodies to help us implement and utilize this kind of things. Um, yeah. And so I think you said it, you summarized it, like the problems exactly, you know, how I would say it, but the only thing that I can see why maybe there's a glimmer of maybe, I don't want to use the word validity because I agree with you, Corinne, um, but of why courts is trying to say that NSAIDs are bad. So, and this can, we can transition into a paper and I just have to put this forward because when we're talking about ultra running and we're talking about doing things to the extreme, you do, it's not the best for your body. I mean, this isn't the first time that I've read a paper that says ultra running isn't, you know, the best for you, but when we're, when we're particularly talking about NSAIDs. So again, there's these, these non-steroidal, steroidal inflammatory, basically, per, basically trying to prevent inflammation, a painkiller, right? Um, but one of the main mechanisms that I talked about blocking prostaglandins, there's research that may indicate that doing this can reduce blood flow to the kidneys, which can cause damage. And so um, one of the, well, we're going to talk about this paper next, Keely, you can kind of go into it from here as I'm introducing it. But one of the main takeaways from this Teller paper that we are talking about um, is that one of the main things is the kidney damage, right? We have acute kidney damage just by running. And so if you're taking NSAIDs in addition to running an ultra, maybe that could actually, you know, hurt you doubly, but also then why isn't Tylenol on this list? Because that's also a painkiller. And you can, I think actually there's more, it's more dangerous. Tylenol can be more dangerous, you know? And, and so if, if you're blocking, if you're saying people can't use NSAIDs and they're going to take Tylenol, it's like, you know, they want to take the edge off or something, then they can go into like acute liver failure. Sweet courts. Thanks. Like extra, extra good. But I think that, so we're going to, we're going to dive into this paper. Keely's going to, I don't know, attack us with it a little bit here, but essentially, right. Like is running bad for you? I don't know. I think, that, but, but this paper is going to start to get some hype in the running media space. And so it's important for us to talk about it because I think that oftentimes when these papers get covered, they don't go deep enough. They're like hot take, hot take, hot take. And it's like, okay, what was the actual end message? Like, what do we learn from it? So there, there's a spot that you want to start Keely, as far as like how bad ultra running is for our bodies, supposedly, potentially. In particular for women. Well, I think first of all, Nick Tiller's crushing it. So we're going to dive into another Nick Tiller article. Um, He's been summarizing a lot of pre-existing research out there. So this is not new research studies. This is just summarizing a lot of the stuff that's out there. In this particular article, he not only summarized a lot of previous studies, but he kind of brought on an advisory board of physicians and PhDs who are experts in these realms and kind of asked them to write certain chapters of this article, um, going over the implications that ultra running can have on health. Um, and so, yeah, he dives it into it into like pretty cool like succinct areas. And obviously to Hillary's previous point, he starts talking about kidney function, which we all obviously can agree that 
just running for that long of a distance may impact the kidneys. However, it does not need to. If you stay hydrated and you're fueling properly throughout the entire run and you're watching your sodium intake, like you can probably finish an ultra without acute kidney damage or kidney failure. Um, I actually that, that remember- should be, That should be like your A goal, the goal for the race. Well, I remember it, but the sad- No kidney damage. The sad thing is, is there was actually a tweet and I'm not going to say who it was from, but there was a tweet about three years ago after someone who reached top 10 in uh, Western States. And it said something along the lines of the only way to do a, have a successful Western States and to be top 10 in this sport is to knowingly like go into kidney failure by pushing your body that hard. And, and that tweet like angered me to the nth degree, because I don't think that you actually have to do that to be good in this sport. I think that we have so far to go in this sport to like actually understand how to be healthy in it, that it doesn't necessarily mean you have to kill yourself to do these races. And so that really angered me, but this paper in general is, is going through a lot of the negative impacts of the sport. And so I, I hope to lend some light on the negative things, but also I think we should also be proving that this sport doesn't necessarily have to be so negative. Um, so the, the next chapter he kind of dives into is cardiac function. Um, and a lot of this is around just the constant use and inflammation of the heart. Right. And so, um, like that just kind of can lead to a lot of different issues. And Corinne, I don't know if you want to go through some of those things that he highlights in there and then kind of talk to what you think from a positive lens. But in my mind, I've always been told that cardiac health is improved with running. So uh, it, it's interesting to also see that there's some negative impacts. Yeah. And they talk a lot about like left ventricle in particular getting, getting enlarged and that can have some, that can have some issues, but generally speaking. So what they highlight in the, in the journal article is that, you know, once again, your your increasing inflammation, you're specifically increasing ventricle size. They've been they've done a lot of research on like um like coronary artery disease and that kind of stuff in and around running and and are you adding rigidity? Um is the enlargement of a like a an aerobically active heart a, a bad thing? Like what are the risks there? And there's this there's this intro quote from a Tracy Hogue article um that she wrote for our running on science column with Iron Farr a couple of years ago. Um, and she, she is an MD PhD. She is maybe smarter than all of us combined here, which is saying something. Um, but she said, okay, people ask all the time, like, well, is running, is ultra running bad for my heart? And she says, when people ask this question, I like to think that they are really asking two questions. One, what is the short-term risk of suffering a cardiac event, i.e. a heart attack or a danger, a dangerous cardiac rhythm. So like going into AFib or VFib, um, while running or racing. And then two, what are the long-term effects of running on the heart? And she says, the answer to question one is that there is indeed a slightly increased risk of a cardiac event during strenuous exercise. If this is the big important part, if you are predisposed by coronary artery disease, hyper, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and many other conditions, this is why so many people like keel over during sprint triathlons and, and road marathons, because, um, they don't do the proper training. They have these underlying conditions. Um, they're not in the best of health. And then they try to go really fast and really hard and they have an issue. Um, then she said, um, however, the risk overall is very, very small. And then the answer to question two is that running and exercise greatly improve cardiovascular health and decrease your cardiac risk and overall more overall, um, all cause mortality. So essentially, yes, there are some potentially, um, some potential issues with doing a lot of intense exercise or a lot of long aerobic exercise, but those risks are small. And they are vastly overweighed by the positives of running of aerobic exercise on long-term cardiac function. So I think that's the big takeaway here is like, we can get scared and fear mongery with some of these little, little stats here and there. Um, but oftentimes when we look at all cause mortality and like longevity in, in healthy life in general, it's gonna, it's gonna be like sunny side up for ultra runners. And I think it's important that we don't get bogged down in that. Um, that being said over and over again, what you're going to see in each one of these like chapters that they wrote for the paper was like, but if you have, um, you know, like you've got, I don't know, uh, yeah, like a, an underlying heart condition, an underlying respiratory condition. Yeah. Like a sp sport could exacerbate that or could put you at higher risk, but that's not the entire population. And I think that's important to, to understand once again, we're not physicians. Okay. That's like, that's a good disclaimer right now. We're not <laughs> physicians. Um, our education's all piled up, might be close to an MD, but, um, you know, so if you are worried about any of these things, like seeing your, seeing your primary care provider, 
and, you know, having your routine checkups, they're going to look at your heart. They're going to do EKGs. They're going to do CBCs. They're going to let you know what, if you have any, have any health conditions, those are people who are going to be at risk for some of this stuff versus the general population that changes as we all age, but it's kind of, it's going to be your genetics versus activity here a little bit. Totally. And I feel like this is kind of the caveat with everything here is that we do these things to an extreme. So we are working the heart muscles to the nth degree. Like there's not been a ton of long-term research on people running hundreds of miles repetitively throughout year after year after year and how that impacts the heart. So this paper is kind of just cautioning what these impacts could be. And, and like anything, the heart is a muscle, right? And so if we are training correctly and we are recovering and we are giving ourselves rest and we are letting our muscles recover and we are giving our heart a break after these big events, like that's going to set us up for more success than, than not. And, and there, there's an important caveat here, which is that there has been research done, not on ultra marathoners, but on marathon runners and shorter distance runners. And honestly, many of us train very similarly to those individuals. We do longer events, but if you look at the average heart rate of our events, for example, like, yes, it's a long time, but it's at a very low, um, cardiac output or a much lower cardiac output than saying, trying to run your fastest marathon. Um, and that I think isn't accounted for well, when we make some of these cautionary statements, because like, I don't know, maybe we should do a research project on through hikers. Cause honestly, through hiking periodically is not that dissimilar from ultra running. So I think that that's another piece of the puzzle is that there has been research done on, on people who run consistently and people who race marathons. Um, so it's like, what is the one day event implication versus the training implication I think is important here as well which we don't know the answers to that, that that is like a hypothetical question for future researchers. Yeah. And one thing I do want to kind of maybe tie back to our whole conversation with doping and, and, and the courts that kind of what they're, what they're trying to implement now is this whole idea, you know, of these, these therapeutic, therapeutic use exemptions, right. These TUEs and in the Tiller paper, he goes through all of these things and, you know, in the research, there's, if you have this condition, there's this exception. So I think this is something that we need to keep in mind that it that is actually important that every individual is different and that completely, you know, disregarding these outliers or people that have these, these pre-existing conditions, it's not the solution. And yeah, that's just my two cents. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Yeah. And so I guess getting back to that paper, he does go through a couple more of the key like systems of the body, starting with the respiratory system. Uh, I can't, I can remember very recently coughing in the grocery store, which after the pandemic is, is not allowed anymore. However, it was directly after Western States. And I don't know about you guys, but after really long days running, I have the worst runner's cough. Um, and so I thought this next section was kind of funny because he talks through the respiratory system and talks how you could have exercise induced bronchoconstriction, um, which could just make breathing more difficult. And if you have this happen for a very long amount of time, this could result in some overuse issues where those muscles are basically just firing for a very long time. Um, and then basically could result in like less warm air getting in there. And so it could just overall make breathing more uncomfortable. Um, but basically this part kind of came down to a similar conclusion to some where they are unsure how long distance running for like hundred mile races, um, impacts the respiratory system. Um, and then he kind of dives from that into the musculoskeletal system, which I think we all have a lot more like personal anecdotes around, Um, And this was a pretty shocking stat to me where he quoted 90% of injuries in ultra running from papers he previously reviewed was 90% overuse in in nature, which um, is shocking, but also not so shocking. Totally. Totally. I guess you're also not versus traumatic. Like the other option would be traumatic bone injuries, which is like how many Hillary here is maybe the exemption to this where she fell off a cliff right? Like most people in our sport do not endure traumatic musculoskeletal issues. They are, they are all those injuries, all your tendinopathies, all your stress fractures. Those are all overuse injuries, right? Unless you get a car on your run or fall off a cliff on your run or have a tree fall on you on the run. I don't know. I guess I'm going to counter that. I, I would, I would say overuse is when you are, and this is probably me defining it incorrectly, but I was putting overuse with something where you are constantly running on something and that is what's wearing it down because of some 
other conditions. This is important. So I had a conversation with the PT um, for a podcast and I said, okay, so people want to know how do you avoid shin splints? They want to know how do you avoid um, like hamstring issues or hip issues or blah, blah, blah. And she said, okay, well, is your workload too high? Because you know how you eliminate that? Your workload, like you cut your workload to an appropriate amount. And so I do think that like, overuse. Yes. It could be a biomechanical imbalance. It could be something else. Um, they can, they can, they can like, so for example, my, my bone stress injury this, this winter, I'm super tight. I have tight adductors. My body wasn't functioning quite right. And I ran and I continued to run on it, which is overuse. And I stress fractured both my pubic grandma. So it, to me, that is, that is a, that is an overuse. Injury. Yeah. I think that is overuse, but I'd say. I think besides ACL ruptures, which are generally traumatic in nature. I don't, I can't think of I what name, name injuries for me. That I guess I'm thinking injuries. like if you, if you are running and you, if you twist your ankle, that's not considered overuse injury. No, twist, twisting your ankle. So that, that'd be traumatic. That's a traumatic injury though. But I think mm-hmm. that's a small, I think it's a small percentage of injuries that most runners face is, is our quote unquote trauma injuries, right? Most people end up with tendinopathies or bone stress injuries or tendinitis, right? Do I need a TUE, Corinne, if I had like the trauma? (laughs) No, no TUE there. But I think to, to, to what Keely's saying is I agree, like overuse injury, but I think that there's another layer. And I think this kind of gets into, this gets into to women and also kids when we're talking about training, but then also endocrine. And we're talking about more of a, like the, the systems, energy, availability, hormones, where all the stuff is going, all the energy is going when you then add on training on top of it. So I think, yes, it can be an overuse injury. But when I think about overuse injuries, I'm thinking about biomechanics and structural when really like stress fractures, that's actually not just an overuse injury that has another layer of energy availability sometimes sometimes right. but but here okay here's my here's my counter counter very argument. well said here's my counter counter argument so you're talking about reds or red s relative energy deficiency in sport okay if you are training more than your nutritional intake allows is that not in a way also overuse you're overusing your body to me. Like that, that is like, you're over, you're overrunning your stores. You're overusing your body. I don't know. I think the 90% to me makes sense because I I can't, I, I think that that still counts because if you, yeah. if you didn't have, if you didn't have reds, like may, maybe you're right. Maybe you wouldn't have some sort of hormonal imbalance that made you, made you more susceptible to that tendinopathy. Okay. Yeah. Like we're, we're totally. doing like the if of the if here, but Like that's still, to me, it's like, you're still overrunning your body's ability to do the training. And that to me is still overuse. Yes, I completely agree. But I also think it's like a multi-dimensional Venn diagram where there's so many different overlapping entities that it can't just be binned into overuse and traumatic. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. And then also with like, with, I think, getting into the different in physiology with men versus women, right? This Venn diagram gets like a 12th dimension or something like this. So, I mean, this is an episode that we want to go into more like red S I think is a bunch is a relative energy deficiency syndrome. Yes. Um, but we want to, d- to dedicate an episode to this. Cause I think it deserves, um, we need to go dive into this more. Um, and I'm excited to do it, but I think maybe not <laughs> right now. Yeah, totally. And I think, I think I was just shocked at this stat because in my mind, I associate overuse with poor training and just like a lot of underlying conditions in the sport. And it more just made me kind of sad, especially with 21% of female endurance runners doing ultra marathons had a stress fracture, which was like double what a normal runner's percentage to having one would be. And so in my mind, like, yeah, we're out there way longer. And we all know that if we just run less and we're out there less, our propensity for injury goes down. And so, oh, but I totally get it now, Corinne, the overuse, you're overusing your syndrome, your system. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> See, I knew, I knew you'd come around to my, to my ideology here, but I get it. Yeah. we want to talk about this more. And we also want to talk about, um, there was a really interesting society slam topic that we brought up last episode from Keely, where people wanted to talk about particularly males coaching female athletes. But I think in our conversations as a group this week, we won. It's, it's not just female centric. I think you can mess up young male athletes as well and, and old male athletes. 
Um, I've worked with male athletes who have, who have disordered eating, who, who fall in that. That's why red S is a thing is so that female athlete triad goes beyond just this one thing. Um, but so we're, we're going to cover this next time, but I think there's one more good summary piece from the tiller paper, and then we'll let you guys go in just a little bit. Keely, you want to, you want to summarize the tiller paper real quickly? The most, what I think is the most important part. I like highlighted it and put it in bold. <laughs> you read my mind. Um, yeah. So I think we'll just leave you with this lovely little quote. Um, basically Tiller ends it with saying moderate physical activity is well known to have positive effects on health, being preventative against numerous lifestyle related diseases and reducing all cause mortality. Similarly, many of these benefits can be derived from participation in ultra running and the sport can generally be considered a safe and healthy pastime. So we are still in this crazy sport of ours. We hope you guys are too, but as anything, there's obviously things that could happen and there are areas that we should, you know, pay more attention to in the future. But for now, let's leave us with that nice positive note. <laughs> yeah. So continue to slide into our DMS, shoot us your race results. Um, give us your opinions on, I think this was an interesting episode, right? This, this doping stuff, the courts program stuff. I think, you know, we, in some ways we only, we only grazed to the surface of it. Um, do, does anyone have society slams that they want to add in here? I think, I know I had some fun ones too. Hillary wants to go right now. So Hillary is going to give her society slam stat. Yeah. So I'm really excited to say this one, um, only just because it's related to Corinne and her wedding. Um, so I got, a message from actually a couple that I coach um, talking about how when Corinne changed changed her name or she's talking about if she wanted to change her name or not. Um, and this couple, um, this is from Sophie, and she was uh, in medical school um, and she was trying to figure out if she wanted to change her name or take her wife's name, her wife's last name. And they, she decided to do it because there's a lot of barriers for same-sex couples and it, there'd be less questions. Like, for instance, if someone had to go to the hospital, um, you know, there's less explanation when you have the same name. Um, but she was also talking about how it meant a lot to Jamie and... And, um, you know, taking her last name. So, yeah, that's why she decided to to change it. Um, and she also had just kind of a, a question um, and just a comment. Um, she said she's a huge, she believes hugely in women supporting women in all aspects of life, but, and especially sport. But um, she feels that outside of races, it's so hard to find other women to train with because there is still a discrepancy in gender roles and fear. She said she lives in a community that has a lot of runners, but most of the women only do shorter local races because they cannot be away from their family to train or to race. Uh, and the women that do trail run generally run in a large women's group or with, you know, their boyfriends or husbands because it's safer. So I think she wanted to, um, she just wanted kind of our thoughts on this. Um, I think that's something that we can kind of elaborate on or maybe, you know, start one of our episodes discussing this topic a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, that was a really, a really cool one kind of relating to, to Corinne's, uh, you know, if Corinne, I don't know if she's changed her name or not, we'll, we'll, we'll find that out sooner enough. My society slam was from a lovely woman who just wanted to shed her praise, but also she wanted to highlight that um, when we were talking about female relationships in the sport, that we also have to remember like the female competition on social media and how that social media shapes our view of other women and how that can like actually impact how other women feel at start lines. And I just thought that was really interesting because I think I kind of take that for granted because I know a lot of wonderful people on social media, but I, I guess like if you only know someone that way, that's how you form your opinion of them. And then to also think about that from a sponsor lens. And then also in the previous episode, we talked to how we're kind of all competing for like the small amount of sponsorships. Um, it could lend to just like a very weird balance in the sport where you have people portraying themselves one way on social media and then you meet them in, in person and, and they're kind of a different way. And then there's like this kind of weird tension between like social media and real life. Um, and that just kind of got me thinking and it was just a really weird, a really cool point that that person had made. I love that. Um, mine was from a French Canadian runner who um, just recently did a trail marathon at 21 weeks pregnant. Um, she messaged me to say, Hey, I'm French Canadian. And in Quebec, we don't change our last names. Like it's not something that we do. Um, just like as a society, we don't do that, which I was like, cool. I love that. Um, 
it's like in Spain how they get both they get both names and they said I have two last names, which I think like for kids, for example, like parents don't change their names. Um, but she was wondering, um, she she had a phenomenal race running 21 weeks pregnant, planned her pregnancy so that she could so that her due date will be in January so that she uh, won't miss like, you know, quote unquote, like a whole nother season in a lot of ways. And she was really curious. She's having a hard time finding literature on both running and exercising while pregnant and then kind of return to running post-pregnancy. And obviously there's a lot of var variability there as to what women can do while pregnant and what they can do immediately post um, post delivery. Um, but I think it's a super fascinating topic. And I think that we would love to find either maybe like a pelvic floor PT or a, I don't know, a pregnancy guru in the ultra running world um, to, to, to talk with about this topic, because although none of us have had kids, um, like I, I for sure plan to have a family in the future, um, a ways off still yet, but I do think it's an important topic. And I think that many, we have, you know, there are runners that get pregnant. There are um, runners who find, pre like who find running through pregnancy and post-pregnancy. And I think it's a really important topic. Um, because we shame a lot of women for exercising while they're pregnant. And I think it's insane. So um, thank you so much for that feedback and that question. And we will find ways to dive into that in future episodes. So keep sending us your thoughts, slide into our DMs. I'm never going to stop saying that. Um, we're so excited to uh, be in your ears this week and we'll be making another episode soon. Yeah. Everything in moderation, friends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Except for chocolate.